Holy Spirit, we ask you to escort us up that mountain called the knowledge of God, the beauty of Christ Jesus. I ask that you would fan the flame that you've already ignited in our soul as a people. Holy Spirit, come and fan the flame, I ask you. Tonight, I ask you that you would seal hearts even in that next dimension of your divine sealing. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Okay, session 15, the transcendent beauty of Jesus. Now, we understand that we looked at these verses uh, very, very briefly last week in their context. The context is the young bride in the midst of the ultimate twofold test. She gives one of the most powerful descriptions of Jesus and one of the most outstanding expressions of worship in the Word of God. This is the one time in the song where she pours herself out in worship to the King. It is magnificent, poetic. It's a magnificent, poetic unveiling of the splendor and the beauty of Christ Jesus. Again, in chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, what I call the ultimate twofold test is The first is the Lord withdraws His presence, and she encounters severe disappointment in the form of a spiritual crisis. The thing that she longs for most, to be drawn by the Lord, to be drawn into His presence. Remember the very beginning of the song, draw me after you. Let me experience your presence and intimacy with God. This drawing grace is seemingly lifted. She's in a spiritual crisis, the disappointment of not being able to feel the presence of the Lord. The second is she is wounded by the leaders in the body. This is a disappointment in the form of a circumstantial crisis, a circumstantial crisis that touches key relationships in her life, a circumstantial crisis that touches the uh, significant life mission she has in terms of impacting others, of being an agent of change in the world. It's a very significant disappointment in terms of circumstances. So she experiences a spiritual crisis, the Lord withdraws His presence, and a circumstance crisis. She is severely disappointed on two accounts, spiritually and circumstantially. Chapter 5, verse 10 to 16, gives us understanding of how she was equipped by the Holy Spirit in the revelation of Jesus to walk through the crisis. Now the reason this twofold crisis is so essential because as Job was a picture of the great disappointing spiritual and circumstantial crisis that the bride went through, so I believe that the church at the end of the age will encounter both dimensions of severe disappointment. There will be spiritual disappointments in our life with God, in our private life with God, and there will be circumstantial disappointments that touch relationships, that touch our mission in life. Regardless how it's walked out in the, in the bride's experience here, it's a disappointment that touched the very core of her being. And I believe that the Lord is going to t- allow the end time church to be tested, refined and strengthened and purified in spiritual and circumstantial crisis. And I believe the same answer, the beauty of the Lord that equips and sustains the bride in chapter 5, that equips and, sust- and sustains Job in, in, in the book of Job, is what the Holy Spirit is going to do for the church in these days. Very, very significant passage of Scripture. The passage of Scripture is meant to equip our soul to effectively worship God in times of testing. Again, I believe Job, Job is a picture The most righteous man on the earth, I believe the most mature generation in all redeemed history is going to be touched, and the Lord is going to release a double portion at the end, and the beauty of God's revelation will sustain the church as Job was sustained by the beauty, by the revelation of the beauty of the Lord. This is a must passage to master. I want to stress that in our journey in growing in mature bridal affections for the Lord. It's a must passage. I want to challenge some of you to take serious time in the next months and years in, in, the, in these seven verses and ask the Holy Spirit to unfold it to you. The Holy Spirit speaks in parables. He speaks p- 
poetically, in order to give more to the hungry. To give more to the hungry. God often speaks of deep things in the hidden language of, of divine poetry, romantic poetry, in the hidden language of divine parables. And one of his reasons is that he would give more on the basis of spiritual hunger. He would hide the deep things and only give if there was a cry in the spirit that could not go without deeper revelation. It's one of the reasons the Lord spoke in parables. His, uh, one of the reasons was the very reason of love itself, that he knew the heart of the lover, the hungry heart of the lover would press in for more. And that without the hungry heart of love, they... The person would go without understanding. In this passage, the Holy Spirit uses metaphors of the human body to, conf- to convey ten attributes of God's personality. The full meaning is somewhat, I should say it a little differently, is significantly hidden <laughs> in the language of divine romantic poetry. It's hidden, there's one degree we can enter into uh, it quite easily, and hopefully we will touch that degree tonight. But I am convinced, having spent 10 years on Song of Solomon chapter 5, I don't mean every day of every year, but have pondered it, looked at it for 10 years, I am absolutely convinced that this statement of the beauty of the Lord has r- levels that unfold and unfold and unfold And as I stand before the Lord with this in my heart, I go, Lord, I'm at the beginning of the beginning, and I have the assurance from the Lord that's absolutely true. She gives a very poetic and dynamic statement of the glory of Jesus. The bride gives 12 descriptive statements. The first one is a general statement, then 10 distinctive attributes of God, and then the last statement is is a summary statement of the glory of the Lord as well. Each of the ten attributes will have two descriptions or two facets of that one attribute that are highlighted. The context again for this passage, the daughters of Jerusalem have asked the question to the severely tested bride. They could see the spiritual and the circumstantial disappointment. They could see that her key relationships are disrupted. Her mission in life is disrupted. Her circumstances are completely in upheaval. Yet in 5.8, she proclaims, she asks for help from anybody that can help her because she's lovesick versus being offended. And it was this reality of lovesickness that awakened them and stirred them. They said, It pressed them to say, what is the source of this lovesickness? What is it that you know that we don't know that sustains you in such love instead of allowing you to fall prey to accusation against the Lord? Because the enemy stands right at the door whispering accusations against God at each step of testing in our life. The daughter's of Jerusalem asked the question, how could you possibly worship him under such duress? This passage gives us the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge she possessed that equipped her to worship God in holy lovesickness. The knowledge of these ten attributes stabilize us in the midst of the storms of life or in the dark night of the soul in the same way. The Job 38 to 42, the revelation of the beauty of the Lord stabilized Job in the midst of his dark night of the soul in the same way that God will stabilize the end time church. Remember Revelation 15 verse 2, the bride comes off the attack of the enemy victorious at the end of the age. She loses her life, her life is taken in martyrdom, but she's victorious in love. And I believe that it is the beauty of the Lord. And I believe the bridal paradigm is absolutely essential for us to come off the attacks of the enemy victorious as we stand on that sea of glass like crystal in the last day. This is the knowledge of Jesus' beauty that empowered her to be an extravagant worshiper under severe testing. Once we see such divine beauty, we can never draw back. Now, of course, what I'm wanting to do right now is to, by these uh, sentences, by these statements, to have you in your heart say, I need to really get serious about these seven verses. That's what I hope is happening in your heart right now. I'm not going to spend as much time going over the seven verses because uh, 
it's, it'll be a lifelong journey. I give you a beginning point, and there's many commentaries and much study to be done, but I want to convince you of the value of these 12 statements, 10 of them being direct revelations of the attributes of the beauty of the Lord. It's normal for the immature believer to be easily offended in trials. All of us know what it means to be offended at the Lord in trials. There isn't a believer on the earth that has not experienced that who's seeking the Lord. Many find it easy to be preoccupied with our own feelings of disappointment that God is mistreating us. It's a very, very normal and common manifestation of the unrenewed mind which we all have. But she is focusing on his majestic beauty instead of being preoccupied with her own pressures and her own sense of disappointment. That is supernatural life to be preoccupied with these truths versus the natural preoccupation with the sense of being disappointed and being mistreated. The enemy, again, is, is, uh, is, is, is there at all times to whisper in our ears accusations against the Lord that would cause us to question His wisdom and His commitment to love us tenderly. These are the 12 main statements that she spoke back to God with understanding in her heart. These were confessions of faith to strengthen her heart during the severe trials. She spoke these realities of God back to God to strengthen her soul. Again, I I want to strongly uh, call you to uh, familiarize yourself with these statements and to go deep with them over the next literally the next decades, not just the next month or two, but to live our life in the overflow, in the shadow of these, the shade of these uh, re- revelations of the beauty of the Lord. These are the actual revelations the Holy Spirit recorded for us as we seek to imitate the bride's response of lovesickness. I'll say that again. These are the actual revelations the Holy Spirit is saying to the end time church, the bride, These truths will cause your lovesickness to grow under trials instead of of waning and and weakening with offense against God. Every one of us in this room are in some form of trial right now. The enemy wants our love, our lovesickness to wane, to be weakened. I'm telling you by the word of God, these are the revelations that caused her lovesickness to grow strong in the midst of disappointment. These are the ones that he purposefully wants us to know in our journey. Three purposes are being accomplished in this passage, verse 10 to 16. Number one, she's answering the the, uh, daughter's question, the the question of the daughters of Jerusalem. She's answering the daughter's question. The young maidens, the daughters of Jerusalem, they said, why are you so in love when you should be disappointed? She's answering that question. She's helping others. And those that mature in love will, like in the storyline of the Song of Solomon, will be used to strengthen the young daughters of Jerusalem. Whether they they may be old uh, in chronological age, but they'll be young in the spirit. These are the answers that God wants his, His maturing church to feed the others on when they are perplexed by the journey to the first commandment in the midst of pressures and disappointments. These answers, she gives the answers that heal and strengthen her soul in lovesickness while enduring pressures. She's allowing us to know what strengthened her. These are, the, these are the very answers she's feeding on to revitalize and renew her own love. It's not just answers for others. This is where she retreats in her inner life before God to, to eat and to feast at this table. She's opening her heart in a testimonial way, saying, this is what I fed on. It's not just an answer for others. It's not just a counseling technique. This is what sustained my soul in lovesickness from, verse, from chapter 5, verse 8. She is moving the heart of God the whole time, even though she doesn't feel anything. We find that out in chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. The heart, she feels nothing. God feels intensely. And that is such a magnificent and a significant truth When we feel nothing, yet we remain faithful, he feels intensely about what we're going through and about us. That takes the Holy Spirit to enter into that reality. She felt nothing, he felt everything that was good about her. 
And these, this is the mindset, this was the reality she walked in that moved the heart of God when he looked at her. He looked at the, how she esteemed him and that moved his own heart. The esteem and the reality she had before him. He said, I love the way you love me is what in essence is happening. The mystery of God's beauty must be sought with diligence. We're going to skip that. We're going to skip the next couple pages. Again, it's just for extra reading. The bride is describing Jesus using the imagery of the temple with gold, precious stones, ivory, and cedars of Lebanon. She's also describing Jesus using the imagery of the human body. She's obviously not uh, trying to describe Jesus' actual physical appearance, but rather his spiritual attributes, facets of his personality, dimensions of his emotional makeup. Equally intense is Song of Solomon 6, 4 to 10. He answers her with an extravagant statement of love that surpasses even this statement of extravagant love that she speaks from her heart back to him. See, in in, in chapter 5, she gives the most dramatic statement of love. In chapter 6, he answers her in an equally and even more intense statement of her beauty before him. Chapter 5 is his beauty to her. Chapter 6 is his beauty to... Is her beauty to him, both of them are startling and stunning, and both of them are essential to equip us in the midst of trials and disappointments in life. Okay, verse by verse study. She starts with the general statement of his beauty in verse 10, which then she thoroughly develops in verse 11 to 15. Then she sums it all up in verse 16. The general description of Jesus. She maintains her adoration throughout the recent season of testing. She maintains her adoration. She maintains her lovesickness for the Lord in the midst of disappointment. The spiritual crisis as well as the circumstantial uh, crisis. Severe disappointments. She starts off, her answer begins with, my beloved. He is white. He is ruddy. Chief among 10,000. But the phrase we're looking at is, my beloved. The daughters of Jerusalem asked the question, why do you love him so much? She said, Jesus is her beloved. She's lovesick for the Lord. She maintains her love for Jesus throughout the entire time. There are seasons of testing where it's difficult to say to the Lord, my beloved. Rather, it's easier to complain. My heart is hurt, Lord. I don't trust you. It's not wrong to tell the Lord your heart is hurt, and it's not wrong to tell the Lord you don't trust Him, if it's true. Matter of fact, it's part of being delivered by being honest and open-hearted before the Lord. The Psalms are filled with our weakness and openness before the Lord. But it's very difficult in testing to come before the Lord with an open spirit and say, Oh, the one that makes me lovesick. There's no offense in her heart at all. Our relationship with God can become wounded in the sense that we become offended at God because we cannot see that everything is working together for good. God wants us to open our spirit to Him in the midst of trials without being guarded towards Him. If our, it's a very important principle. If our trust in Him is wounded in the midst of the disappointments of a trial, then our relationship in love towards him, our love relationship becomes wounded. I talk to people all the time and they want to know how they can restore their passion for Jesus and and what uh, sometimes they're unaware of is that their relationship towards the Lord is wounded and their spirit is guarded. They're wounded, the relationship is wounded in the sense they feel accusation and condemnation because of their weakness or they feel mistrust towards him in their disappointment. They sin and feel accused and therefore they close their spirit. Or they go through difficulty and they feel disappointed and offended, therefore they close their spirit. You cannot grow in love with a closed spirit. And it's the, it's the word of God. It's the, it's the renewing of the mind that empowers the spirit to be reopened to the Lord. 
The word of God entering the heart, changing the mind, therefore the emotions, empowers us to open our spirit so we throw off the, the perils of accusation and the perils of offense that comes through disappointment. And with an open spirit, when we could call him my beloved, that is the context, no matter how immature we are, it's that context where the accusation and the offense are, are moved to the side. That's the context of which the love of God grows in us. And the way that God frees us is through the ministry of the Word of God. That's why these, these confessions of faith are so important. The statements of revelation she has, these were the, the expressions of her renewed mind that help her to throw off accusation against the Lord and accusation against herself. Accusation against herself is called condemnation. Accusation against the Lord is offense towards the Lord. We don't trust Him because we're disappointed in circumstances. The first one, we're disappointed in ourselves. The second one, we're disappointed in the Lord. We close our spirit nonetheless. He is white, she says. The NIV translate, He's radiant. I like that. The New American Standard translate, He is dazzling. I like that too. Another, several other versions say, He is brilliant. She says, My beloved, I'll tell you why I love Him. I'm lovesick because he's dazzling. He strikes my heart. I'm awestruck. I'm dazzled. The word white in the New King James is a, is a, uh, a weak word compared to the strength of the Hebrew word. I like dazzling and radiant. This longing to be fascinated, she is now bringing us on the journey of how God has satisfied her longing to be fascinated, and, it, and she is satisfied by the unveiling of the beauty of the Lord. In chapter 4, if, if you can remember the, the seven uh, uh, longings of the bridal paradigm, the first longing is the, longing, the assurance that we are enjoyed. He answers that profoundly in chapter 4. The second longing is her longing to be fascinated, which the Lord answers by unveiling His beauty. She is going to be dazzled, awestruck, fascinated with the beauty of the Lord. That longing is going to be answered. The next longing that we developed in the bridal paradigm is her longing to be adorned, to feel beautiful. That's chapter 6. Her longing to be great is the next one in the bridal paradigm. That is answered in chapter 6. And the longing for intimacy, all three of those, to be adorned, to be great, and to experience intimacy are all answered in chapter 6 in a very, very direct way. But right now in chapter 5, her longing to be awestruck, to be dazzled, to be fascinated, the Holy Spirit is touching it. Again, a, a fascinated person looks at sin entirely different. Fascin people that are spiritually fascinated with the Lord Jesus don't struggle in the way they used to before they were fascinated. I'm not saying there's no struggle at all. The struggle is very, very different. The sins that would dominate us have dominion over us. We may feel their presence, but they don't have dominion over us when we're fascinated. He's, he is white. He's radiant. Dazzling. Brilliant. She goes, I'm fascinated with him. That's the beginning point right there. And then she unfolds why she's fascinated in the next number of statements. The Hebrew word translated as white means radiant, dazzling, brilliant. The Hebrew word is shining white or dazzling brightness. It's dazzling brightness that the New King James translated white. It's like, oh, come on, you can do better than that. It's like somebody looking at the sun and its brightness and saying, what do you see? Oh, it's white. Oh, is that all you see? Anyway, I'm not going to pick on the New King James anymore. I like this version. We're going to skip that. I give uh, the, just, a, just a brief little uh, 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 divine hint from Revelation chapter 4 as to His dazzling splendor around the throne of God. The, 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 the splendor of God around His throne. You can read that on your own some other time. His balanced personality is what she is talking about. The bride cries out, he is ruddy. Ruddy means red complexion. King David was ruddy in appearance in 1, King, in 1 Samuel 6. It said he was handsome and ruddy. It spoke of his reddish hair, his reddish complexion is what it meant. When somebody is physically healthy... Their cheeks are ruddy, or their appearance appears. The, the idea about David, they were saying, his appearance is cheerful and he's healthy. He's, he's bright. He's healthy. And she's saying about the Lord Jesus that 
There's a balance of his attributes. He's healthy. There's a combination of everything that he has. He has internal health that is obvious by viewing and gazing upon him. Number three, Ruddy does not refer to one characteristic, but rather it's the combination of the ten attributes that form his spiritual complexion. The point emphasizes his perfectly balanced personality, making him incomparable to all others. For example, Jesus has a perfect balance of mercy and judgment. There's no contradiction in the Godhead and the personality. Gazing in his face, we walk away saying he possesses a a healthy spiritual complexion. All that goes to contributing to who he is is healthy, and it's sound, and it's balanced. The next thing, he's... Again, in verse 10, it's a general statement. She isn't actually describing any one characteristic. It's a statement of how she's dazzled and fascinated with him. And then she's going to develop the statements one by one. Of which, again, we won't really look at any detail, but you'll have the notes. And you have the other books that, you, that uh, are associated with the class here. Jesus is chief among 10,000. The word translated chief can also be translated distinguished. We find this alternative translation in the margin of the New King James. In other words, it means he is a banner that is distinguished. He is lifted up as a banner, or he is lifted up as a distinguished as a banner among a multitude. He's the one that stands out in all the masses. It's what the psalmist said in Psalm 45. He is more fair, more beautiful than all the sons of men. He stands in a class of his own. It's touching his transcendence. There was none like him. It's a a phrase that depicts he's in a unique category of his own. The very thing he says to her in chapter 6, verse 9, he goes, You are unique. You are the only one. You are in a class of your own. There are no rivals to the bride. There are no rivals to the Son of God amongst all the host of heaven. He's chief among 10,000. He is distinguished amongst all the masses of the order of God. The phrase 10,000 means incomparable greatness. Now she's going to begin to develop the attributes, the 10 attributes, one by one we'll look at. His head is like finest gold. The head is the most prominent part of the body. The head speaks of two different things. Number one, it speaks of God the Father. And number two, it speaks of His personal sovereignty. His Father is designated in the Scriptures the head of Christ. So God the Father is, His head is distributed, attributed as being a fine gold. The Father's leadership over Him is fine gold. His own sovereign leadership is described as fine gold. Gold speaks of divine nature or deity. Gold is a material of the highest value and the highest uh, uh, quality. But it's more than gold. It's finest gold. That's very significant. The leadership over the Lord Jesus, which is God the Father, and His own sovereign leadership as as the heir of all of God the Father's vast empire, is not only of the highest quality gold, it's the finest gold. It's the rarest kind of gold. Only a very small percent of gold was finest gold. It required the processes processes of being refined. This was a very intricate process, and it was a very expensive process to refine gold, especially in the ancient world. So it was very rare, it was very costly, and it stood out very, very, uh, it stood out distinct among all the rest of gold, finest gold. You'll, in, in, uh, in the James Durham book that, that uh, you have, those for extra credit, he does a study on the Hebrew word finest gold, and it's magnificent. Finest gold means the very highest superlative. She's saying Jesus' leadership is excellent. It is of the finest gold imaginable. It is perfectly divinely inspired wisdom is what she's saying. So when they came to her and they said, the essence, the daughters came to her and says, why are you lovesick instead of offended and angry? Why do you believe instead of drawing back in unbelief like we would under your exact circumstance? She says, his leadership is impeccable and the leadership over him is impeccable. I have no fear of his leadership. His sovereign leadership will always lead me to gold. 
Revelation 3.18, Jesus says, I advise you to get gold refined by fire. In other words, the one who is finest gold, who is the gold refined by fire, advises his bride in Revelation 3.18 to partake of the same gold refined by fire. Refinest gold. He says, I want to bring you through processes where you share my qualities. The eternal city is made secure and happy because of the excellency of his golden leadership. She speaks, her, she speaks her first confession of faith before the Lord in the midst of her trial. His perfect leadership is of the highest quality. It will lead me into that which blesses me and enhances my life. His leadership will never lead me to something that destroys the most important things to me. Even if I don't understand them, His leadership will always lead me to the highest and the greatest qualities. Again, unbelief wounds our love relationship with the Lord. She, she confronts the spirit of unbelief in her journey. And this is some of the fruit of her discoveries. His sovereign leadership is finest gold. It cannot be improved upon. It's, it's past the test of time. His wisdom in Genesis 1 is superb. The way he leads natural history the, the very design for the human race to end up as his bride, such impeccable wisdom, such plans. She goes, who, who would not trust someone that, has, that is leading all of created order unto this end to crown us as the bride? His locks. His, lock, his hair speaks of his dedication to God and to his people. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. The NIV translates his locks as his hair. The hair speaks of the Nazarite vow of dedication. The Nazarite vow of consecration forbid the cutting of the hair. And we've developed this study other places uh, in this course earlier on. She says his dedication. Hair speaks of dedication and speaks of his, uh, his beauty. Hair enhances beauty several times in Scripture. But it particularly enhances beauty in the spiritual realm by dedication to God and by his dedication to his people. She, the NIV translates his hair as wavy. I mean, it translates his wavy hair as bushy hair is what I'm saying. She understands that Jesus has hair that is thick and wavy. Thick, wavy hair is the hair of a young man in the prime of life. As contrasted to an old man whose hair has lost its vitality and fullness. Here's the point. She understands his dedication as full of vigor. His dedication to God, his dedication to the church has eternal vigor in it. God never has a bad mood. His hair is as black as raven. Ravens have black hair as contrast, again, the same contrast to the gray hair of an old man. Black hair speaks of youthful, energetic zeal, the opposite of decay and lack of vigor. His dedication is eternally vigorous. Jesus forever flourishes in his prime. His youthfulness, his, his vigilant ded dedication never wanes. It never weakens through the years. It never decays. It never loses its vitality and strength he's always at the very prime his hair is is wavy and black his dedication knows no waning it never draws back in any any regard at all this is her second confession when the presence of the lord was lifted from her heart the discernible presence of the lord was lifted from her which led to her spiritual disappointment and then uh, the circumstantial disappointment when her life mission and her relationships were disrupted by this trial. She knows he's not changed the way he feels. She says, it's impossible that he's lost interest in me. His dedication is black, it's wavy, he's fully energetic. This is what she would say to her own heart, as well as to the daughters of Jerusalem. Why do you love him? She goes, he's lost no interest in me. It only looks that way to you through your unrenewed minds. He's vigorous. He's, he's as committed to me now as he ever has been or ever will be. Even in the midst of my inability to feel any of it, it's still true. Oh, the Lord loves it. The Lord's watching in chapter 6 going, oh, the Lord loves that loving feeling. And so does the bride. 
Threw that in for the romantics in the crowd here. Okay. His eyes or his omniscience. His eyes are like doves by rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. It's a number of uh, characteristics here. Eyes of, uh, speak of the ability to see, the ability to discern. His eyes speak of his omniscience, which means he knows everything. A mass statement, a, va- a vast statement. He knows everything. He has total clarity and fullness of insight into every dark secret, every hidden secret. This is good news to the redeemed and bad news to the rebellious. Everything is totally clear and discernible. The all-seeing eye of God, listen, discerns both our negative and He discerns our our positive. Because the dark secrets of your heart are not just evil things. It's the longings that you possess that never fully are worked out in your life. But they are there. The longings are real and He sees them. And He defines you by the longings of your heart. His eyes see the yes in our spirit. When we fail in our, in our everyday walk, He sees it even more clearly than we do. God sees the cry in our heart to obey Him when in the weakness of our flesh we come up short. His eyes like doves speak of singleness of vision. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters. This speaks of the waters where the doves bathe themselves and become clean. They will go down by the, uh, they, uh, doves are clean after washing themselves by the rivers. His eyes view things through the cleanness of his heart. Jesus' eyes are not just all seeing, but they are pure. They're innocent like clean doves. He interprets knowledge through the cleanness of his heart. A judge, a, a, a earthly judge may know all the facts associated with a case. But if he has an unclean heart, he will misinterpret the information before him. The interpretation of what Jesus sees has no distortion at all. His eyes are clean. He sees perfectly well. Now, we all know that God sees evil, and we all know that God sees our evil, but what the bride knows in the song is that God sees her good, not just her evil. And that's the radical paradigm change. The body of Christ at large is at least familiar with the idea that God knows their dirty dark secrets what they're not familiar or established is that God knows the long the secret longings of their heart that have never been walked out yet because of weakness but the longings are there and he knows those his ability to interpret information through the cleanness of his heart separates him from all others and it causes her to trust him She's standing there, still in her, hum- her, her humanity and her weakness. She knows that the Lord could have a case against her. But the Lord says, I can see the longings of your spirit for me. My eyes are clean. I'm not offended by any of your disloyalty. I'm not put off by you because you haven't done everything according to my plan and purpose. I'm not offended at you. I still see the longing. See, in the human arena, when our best friend does not do what's in our heart, we get offended and we break friendships over it. But the Lord says, I see the longing in your heart. I have such clean view. I don't lose my desire for you when I see your weakness because I see in the midst of your weakness something the Holy Spirit has imparted, a longing to belong to God. He also sees our destiny in the Lord. In relational uh, difficulty, if we could see a person's spirit, the longing of their spirit that is clouded because of their weak flesh, and if we could see their destiny in, the, in God, where they're going in time and in eternity, we would, our enthusiasm would be renewed and maintained uh, a lot better. But we get offended by the mistreatment. It's happened to me many, many times. And I begin then to, dis- my, the information, the clear information is now distorted because my eyes are not clean. But his eyes are clean eyes. He's not offended when we come up short in what is due him from our life. He's so unlike us. We write off the people that come up short. He doesn't. Don't you love that? He interprets information through a clean and a pure and an innocent heart. He has dove's eyes. Doves that have cleaned themselves. His eyes are fitly set. Oh, this is beautiful. This metaphor speak refers to a jewel that is fitly set by the most skillful artist who is constructing a very expensive piece of jewelry. 
An artist skillfully sets a diamond in a necklace. It's unique and costly to fitly set a gem into a necklace. His eyes are skillfully, artistically set. He can see with such skill and such precision. He can see the the end product of what this jewel will be like. And he has the skill to see like the skill of an artist. His eyes are fitly set. His eyes have have been... uh, His eyes can be described as precise and accurate and strategically set there. Of course, he's the uncreated God like the Father. But God's qualities of seeing are like the skillful artist that sets a diamond in a necklace. That's how skillful and how deliberate he sees and how precise and artistic his view is. His cheeks... His cheeks reveal his emotional beauty. His cheeks are like, oh, I love this one too. Well, you've got to love them all. But his cheeks are like a bed of spices, like banks of scented herbs. Oh, magnificent. His cheeks reflect the countenance of the face that reveal the emotional makeup. The cheeks are windows into the emotion. The cheeks enable us to discern whether a person has joy or sadness or anger. When you meet a person, you can tell by the cheeks if they're mad, sad, or glad. Reveals the internal emotional state of a person. Unless, of course, the person's deliberately hiding it. Speaks of his emotional life. One of the uh, key relational dynamics in life is we read a person's, the, the, uh, the, well, we would say their countenance, but countenance is a little different attribute because she's going to talk about his countenance. We look at their face and we say, oh no, or oh yes, when they approach because of the cheeks. Speaks of the, the internal emotional condition. Jesus' emotional life is like a bed, a, a garden bed of beautiful fragrant spices. They're beds of spices. This is fantastic. As a garden filled with delightful fragrances. So the condition of Jesus' emotional life. His affections are fragrant and refreshing to our soul as long as we can discern them. The delights of God are abundant and diverse as banks of sweet-smelling herbs. There are so many different types of emotions that are fragrant within the personality of God. These divine emotions, the, uh, uh, God's uh, emotional makeup is so pleasing to us. A lot of people think that the only emotions God has is joy when we first get saved, and then He has anger and wrath towards us after that. His emotions are heaps of diverse, sweet, and they're fragrant to us. They're heaps of diverse feelings of delight and desire, and they're sweet to the life of the enlightened one, the one with with a renewed mind by the Word of God. The emotional makeup of Jesus is filled with passion, delight, and longing for you. His inward emotional state is like a bed of spices. There's diversity, etc. Oh, our bridegroom is a very, very delightful person to be with. He is cheerful and happy and filled with longing with such pleasant dimensions of his infinitely diverse and eternal emotional makeup that we can only understand just beginnings of his emotional makeup. And and one dynamic thing is, uh, because we're created in the image and the likeness of God, His emotional makeup is reflected in our created design, our divine design. And though in our fallen state we can only see hints of it, but in the resurrected body we will have an experience of delights emotionally that would could be, I believe, called bed a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs like unto Him. Our emotional capacity for delight and pleasure is enhanced in this age above all the rest of creation because we're human. We have a divine design. And it's enhanced significantly more at the new birth. And then it's enhanced significantly more in the resurrection. Animals, even angels, are never described as having these kind of emotional capacities. Even in our human design, even before the new birth, we have the seeds and the tokens of that emotional diversity, parts of it. 
are, are placed by the Lord in our, into our spirit, I mean into our emotional makeup. That the new birth and the renewed mind, our emotions are liberated and we begin to experience more of the, uh, and personally, we begin to feel internally like, like uh, the banks of scented herbs. And then in the resurrection, we'll have emotions like His. And I tell you, it will be the romance of the ages. Two really, really happy people dancing in the dance of love forever and forever and forever. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, I can't wait, I can't wait. It's true. But we can, in the renewed mind by the Word of God, we can enter into some of that dynamic even now. And that's what we want to. But oh, the glory of the fact we have emotions like His, diverse emotions like He does. We don't have the full range that He does, but we have far more than any of the rest of created order. His lips. They're lilies. Oh, the power of the Word of God. His lips. It's speaking of the power of God's Word. They're like lilies. Lilies speak of fragrance, innocence, purity. Jesus' affirming words are tender and sweet to your heart in a, in a new way. <clears throat> now, incidentally, His lips are dripping liquid myrrh. He knows how to speak tough love. There's, the, there's this, the delightful lily purity dimension of what He speaks, but He also beckons us too. He beckons us to the, to the mountain of myrrh. He, his words have the call and the beckoning to enter into the sufferings of Christ in them as well. But when we enter into, when we obey those words, it leads us into intimacy with Him. An intimacy and dimensions of life with God that no other part, of, I mean, I mean uh, the Word of God calls us into the intimacy, both in ministry and in all the, good, the wonderful things, as well as in the intimacy of suffering. His hands speaks of his activities, the way he accomplishes his work. His hands are rods of gold set with burl. His hands or arms refer to the way that he accomplishes his works. His hands, the NIV translates his arms. His hands are skillful to do everything good with perfect power. Again, the gold, the divine character accomplishing his work. His hands are set with burl. Burl is a jewel. Specific designed activity is required when something is set. God's activities are, be- are deliberately set by the hand of God as contrast to arbitrary activities. His works are skillful like a beautiful jewel that is artistically and skillfully set upon gold. God says there's no arbitrary dimension to my activities. My hands are golden in terms of they are most valuable. My activities are they are divine in their wisdom and in their power. And they're skillfully, deliberately set like like gold with jewels set upon that. Everything that God does has the works of Jesus in our life and all creation throughout all history are skillful, precise, filled with divine power, purity, and wisdom. She trusted in the invisible work of the Lord. All of his activities are rods of gold set with burl. This was her confession. She says, I haven't been forgotten. It's not arbitrary. I'm not left to fend for myself. There's a divine design to my life. I don't fully understand it, but I know that his hands, the way that he leads, are precise and golden. There's a deliberate setting to beautify and adorn my life. His body, His tender compassion. It's like carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. Jewels are everywhere. He, he, he uses this, the Holy Spirit uses this metaphor of, of the precise, deliberate, artistic setting of jewels, of priceless gems that is associated with four or five of the different attributes. Of course, we know the eternal city. The artistry of God has its full expression in the city of jewels, the city of diamonds. Malachi 3.17, he says he will make us his jewels. And so part of the way he leads us in, with that artistic, skillful precision in order to produce the beauty of the priceless gem in our life as well. Anyway, his body, the King James translates it his belly. The belly speaks of the tender compassions. The Hebrew word you, used here communicates the idea of yearning or compassion. In A, B, and C, underwards, I mean, uh, uh, under this, the, the Hebrew word 
body or belly is translated yearning. It's the, the belly, the bowels of compassion, it says in Philippians 2 in the King James. The yearnings of God's heart are like carved ivory. One of the greatest distinguishing features of Jesus is his feelings towards the weak and sinful and incompetent. His yearnings, if you want to put it there, his body, his belly, his internal yearnings of compassion are like carved ivory. King James translates it bright ivory. NIV translates it polished ivory. Ivory is clean and white and expensive because it's rare. Carved and polished ivory is very unique. His compassion is described as rare and expensive and unique in history. It's likened unto ivory inlaid with sapphires. And you can read about that. What compassion. The story of how the harlot human race becomes a radiant bride in the embrace of sparkling divine love. The the transcendent beauty of the king pursues the harlot, sinful human race that has no interest in him and lives in agreement with the devil and beautifies her with love and causes her to be radiant and adorned in the embrace of the love of God. This is the carved ivory. There's nothing like it. The harlot becomes the radiant queen, the beauty, the beautiful bride through the power of the the tender yearnings that are like carved ivory, the unique yearnings of our God as He pursues us. I just encourage you to read the notes on these uh, to develop them more. His legs, His walk, or the administration of His purposes. They're like pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. God's plans are executed with strength and dignity and order. You can just read this on your own. The, the metaphor of marble and the metaphor of pillars and strength and gold. Oh, it's glorious. Just read that on your own. We're running out of time. That's how he administrates all of his kingdom in time and eternity. As the king of the, of the Father's vast empire in heaven, he leads it. His ways are durable and stable like pillars of marble set on gold and all of these attributes uh, about his leadership in eternity. His countenance speaks of his impartation to his people. David prayed, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance. He was, his prayer was for the discernible impartation of God's light upon the heart. He says, God, lift your countenance. In other words, David had this image of God's sunlight face shining upon his heart, awakening his heart. The countenance of God, the light of God, stirs and awakens and imparts supernatural qualities to the heart. It's like Lebanon. It's excellent. The fragrance of Lebanon. Again, we're out of time. Oh, his countenance, the supernatural impartation is excellent as fragrant Lebanon, cedars of Lebanon. His mouth, which is distinguished from his lips. There's no redundancy. It's not the same attribute restated. His mouth is first defined at the very beginning of the book as associated with the kisses of the mouth. The mouth speaks of intimacy. She said his mouth is most sweet. Nothing satisfies me like the communication of intimacy with him. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, why am I lovesick? Why am I not offended? Why am not, I not giving up, as Job's wife said, curse God and die? Because the remembrance of past times of his mouth make my heart fill, just flutter with delight. His mouth is most sweet to me. Even the remembrance of it sustains me today in a time of testing. She says, now the ten attributes are finished, she says, He is altogether lovely, His comprehensive beauty. This is my beloved, this is my friend. He's altogether lovely. She starts with the, she ends with a summary statement of His, con- his comprehensive beauty. All, it be, all of His attributes flow together in perfect unity, comprising the most lovely person imaginable. This is the one you are married to forever. He is altogether lovely, infinite and eternal beauty, and it's, and it's focused towards you. You, will, you and I will reap the benefits of this eternal and infinite beauty. Beloved, our life, we have it made. We really do. Even in disappointments. She answers, my beloved is dazzling. He's outstanding. He's totally balanced. His leadership is finest gold. His dedication is eternally vigorous. His knowledge is perfect. 
His emotions are like banks of scented herbs. His word has sweetness of lilies. It woos me out of a life of self-absorbed carnality. His actions are golden like the, like, uh, uh, the uh, marble. His tender yearnings are carved ivory. The way he operates his eternal plan is like durable and stable marble pillars. His countenance releases the impartation of God. His intimacy is the sweetest thing I know. This is my beloved. This is my friend. This is why I'm moving on instead of moving back. Amen. Let's stand. Oh, beloved, this, 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 it's, it's so much deeper. The Word of God will develop this from Genesis to Revelation. Oh, Lord Jesus. We love to love you. We are at such a distance. Your hidden beauty is so fascinating to look at it, even at a distance. Woo us. Strike our hearts with awe. Fascinate us with the unfolding of these things that equip and stabilize us in trials. And Lord, I ask you that you would begin to release the revelation of these qualities to those that you've anointed as forerunners that are pressing in ahead of time in their personal history and God to begin to live in this so as a voice and not only as an echo, they would proclaim the truths of these in depth in a deep way as the end time church is shaken. As the powers of darkness come to rage against us, let us be radiant and made beautiful in lovesickness by the fascinating beauty of Christ Jesus. Raise up forerunners that drink from this well ahead of time. Men and women in whom they have a voice in these things and not merely an echo. That they can be a blessing and a gift to the, to the body of Christ that you send them to. Oh Lord, seal our hearts with revelation we ask you. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.